For a while, I didn't really think much of this experience, because it seemed kind of stupid, and the person I originally told about it brushed it off, for which I don't really blame them. But, after thinking about it for a while, I realized that what happened to me was just too real for me to brush off. So now, I am convinced that what happened was not normal. For some backstory, I live in the United States. My father and I are part of a local hunting club of about 10 or so people. This means that we share payment for the lease of the land with the other 10 members of the club, and in exchange, are allowed to hunt anywhere on the 1,000 acre property. So, back in September or October of 2017, I was bow hunting deer on this property. I was sitting alone in a green box shaped stand while my dad hunted a different part of the property. The stand I was sitting in looks over a medium sized food plot. For those who don't know, a food plot is just an area used to grow plants that deer like to eat. The deer are attracted to plants, which brings them to your stand. To the right of the food plot is the dirt road used to get to the stand, which leads from the stand directly back to the parking area. Anyway, I was on an evening hunt and planning to sit there until I either shot a deer or could no longer see the plot at dusk. The hunt itself was uneventful. I didn't see or hear any deer. So, when I got dark, I packed up my gear, turned on my flashlight, and left the stand, walking back down the dirt road. However, this is when things got weird. I started hearing a sound in the woods to my left as I kept walking. It wasn't too loud, but it sounded pretty close. I just brushed it off, chalking it up to the wind rustling the leaves or something. But it didn't sound like wind hitting leaves. It was different. I stopped walking, and when I did, I heard the sound two more times, quickly, and then nothing. This kind of unnerved me, because it almost sounded like something stepping on the leaves. But I simply brushed this aside too, because it could have been an animal or something. As I kept walking though, I started thinking about what animal would be walking that close to me. Keep in mind, it was dark, and in my area of the US, the only nocturnal animal that might walk that close to a person would be a coyote. And really, the ones in my area are pretty timid, so I ruled this out. I thought that I was just feeling unnerved because I was alone, in the dark, in the woods, etc. But as I thought more about it, and more about the sound, I realized why it had made me so uneasy. It sounded like someone, or something, trying to follow me by mimicking my footsteps. Just like in the movies, where the person will hear two extra footsteps from someone after they stop. This thought begins to make me a little more uneasy. Is there some person following me? I've heard stories about things like that. Again, I just shrugged it off, or tried to anyway. I got to the part of the walk, back to the parking lot where you would have to pass under a canopy of trees, meaning you're surrounded by darkness. I still felt uneasy, almost scared and I just didn't know why. I told myself to quit being stupid and to just walk, but I could still hear the sound. I was walking under this dark canopy, when all of a sudden, it hit me. That shivering sensation down your spine, the one I always hear about in every scary story before something bad happens. With this shiver comes this horrible, horrible sense, this certainty that something's not right. I am not alone. There is something next to me in the woods, and it's gonna get me. That I'm gonna die out here and never be found. Needless to say, I'm getting this feeling in the middle of the woods, in the dark, and it scared the ever-living crap out of me. I started panicking, wanting to run as hard as I could, to just book it out of there. But this weird sense just told me that I shouldn't, and that I needed to just keep walking. I didn't feel dumb anymore for being scared, I just wanted to get out of there. But I kept walking, albeit faster and as far to the right of the road as I could, to get away from the sound. I came to a fork on the road, 
it led to a part of the property, and that meant there was a break in the dense woods next to me. An opening. I felt the sense that if I got there, the thing following me wouldn't be able to go out in the open. If I could just get to that point, I'd be okay. My dread and panic were just growing. I felt like something would jump out and grab me at any moment, but nothing ever did. I made it to the fork in the road. When I did, I shined my light back behind me and saw something. It was near some type of thin brush type plant, so it kind of looked like a plant, but it wasn't. I almost felt that this thing wanted to blend in, that it wanted me to think it was a plant, but it wasn't. I only saw it for a second. Because of all that point, I was ready to just turn around and hurriedly run away. I told my dad about it, but he shrugged it off, so I did too for a while. I've looked up things that might do this, and still don't know what this was. A result that came up almost immediately was a creature called the Hide Behind, but I've still got no clue. The only reason I think something seriously happened to me is because of the weird feeling that just suddenly came over me. And when I went back to that spot where I saw the shape of the plant, there wasn't a plant there. On that night I was walking out, something else definitely was there. To start things off, I am 14 now but this took place a week before my 14th birthday. My parents were divorced, and my dad just moved into his new house a few months prior. He moved into the Rockies from the plains of Colorado, so he could be closer to work. You see, before this he had to take a two hour drive every day up the mountains to get to work, where he would have 11 hour shifts, and then drive back. He was a cop, and had just gotten back to work after eight months from his second major back injury. He ended up suing workers' comp and got a decent sum of money from that. So after a few months, when Christmas rolled around, he got me and my brother AR-15s. I know what you're thinking, but we have grown up around guns and wouldn't think twice about seeing guns laying around the house. We enjoyed Christmas Day, and when nighttime rolled around, we went to our rooms and had the guns in our rooms as we slept. Now, before I tell you this next part, you must know that there are a lot of nut jobs out where I live in the mountains here. Also, my room has two windows, one to the left of me and one to the head of my bed. Anyways, I awoke in the middle of the night. Mind you, that I am in a deep sleep and it is almost impossible to wake me up without shaking me. Immediately, something felt off. So I just stayed still and tried listening to what was going on while pretending I was asleep. I was facing the window to the left of me where I could see the forest out my window. Then I heard it, the lightest tap on the window I was facing. If I wasn't listening, I wouldn't have heard it. I couldn't see anything that could be making that sound. So I just watched and listened. About a minute later, I heard the tap again, followed by crunching of compact snow. Then I saw it. Behind a tree about 20 feet from my window, I saw two glowing eyes peer out. About 30 seconds later, I saw the arm of someone break off a branch and throw it at my window. Not wanting the person to know I was awake, I slowly slid off the other end of my bed and grabbed my AR-15. I loaded a magazine into it. My adrenaline was pumping because the nearest house was at least a quarter mile away and we were deep in the woods. Not wanting the intruder to know I was awake, I didn't charge the charging handle because of how loud it was. I put my phone in my shirt and texted my dad that someone is to the east of the house and immediately after that, I heard the sliding glass door open above me. I saw my dad's flashlight on his AR-15 light up the area. The guy ran and I could see he was wearing nothing but underwear and boots. My dad gave chase, but after going a mile into the woods and searching for about an hour barefoot and in shorts in the snowy woods of the Rockies, he gave up. After he texted someone on duty at the time and searching the surrounding woods, all they found was a shirt and a candle on a tree branch.
This happened in the Appalachian Mountains of northeastern Pennsylvania about a year ago from now. I was camping with some friends at a private campground. We were going to enjoy the weekend at the campsite, and when I got there, I decided to pinch my tent. My friends were kind of loud at night, so I chose to set up my tent across the campsite, near a small pond. The area I had my tent in was a small bit of land that had the pond on my left and a creek on my right, so it was almost like a land bridge between the two bodies of water. When it had gotten to the time for me to go to sleep for the night, I walked to my tent and went to sleep. My tent was by itself across the campsite, because I like my privacy. I went to bed, and boy, I was awoken later in the night. I wasn't sure what time it was when I woke up, but it was still dark out. If I were to guess, I'd say it was around 4 in the morning or so. I put my head back down to go back to sleep, but I was beginning to hear some loud footsteps approaching from the direction of the creek. I listened to them get louder as whatever it was got closer. It wasn't an animal on four legs, like a bear or a deer, because the footsteps were in sets of two. The footsteps were eventually right near my tent and then they stopped. Then I heard it start sniffing the air around me for what felt like hours. I was terrified because I had no clue what was right by my tent. I just stayed still for the hopes that it wouldn't hear me moving. I sat there hoping it would just walk away until it ran back to where it came from. After about an hour, I went to my friend's tents to find them all asleep. It couldn't have been one of my friends because whatever it was ran in the opposite direction of the tents, and I would have heard it walk towards my friend's tents. In the morning, I found the grass near my tent padded down as if something heavy had been standing there for a while. I never experienced anything like that since, and I still don't know what it could have been. So this all happened when I was about 12. I was and still am currently living in the suburbs of Alaska. Around where I lived, there wasn't many people so if you were to scream, it's unlikely anyone would ever hear you. I was in a ditch that was near my neighborhood. I had just gotten home and my older brother wasn't due to get home until an hour later. When I was in the ditch, I was playing, when my attention came to a pair of large footprints. Like any other curious 12-year-old would do, they led me deeper into the ditch, where there was a large curve that separated from civilization after a while, I saw moose prints. I followed those for a bit, but then I saw fresh wolf or dog prints. I knew they were fresh because the prints were still a bit wet. I looked forwards and into the woods a bit. After a moment, I saw two figures move quickly. At first, I thought it was two rabbits, until I remembered the dog prints and realized the two figures were too big to be rabbits. A bit unsettled, but still curiosity filled me I climbed out of the ditch so I could get a better view. I was looking intently into the woods when I saw something moving in my direction. This made me step a few feet back, instantly regretting it because of what I had learned in school of what to do if an animal approached me, and the fact that I couldn't see the animal anymore. At this point, I was slowly taking steps backwards so I could get closer to my home when something caught my eye. I saw another dog to my left. At this point, I said screw it and turned around and walked faster towards home. It took a while and I couldn't exactly run as the snow was up to my knees and it was also at the stage of starting to mount, but being incredibly damp and heavy. After about 10 minutes of walking, I made it home in one piece. I considered myself lucky that the wolves didn't attack me because if they did, I would have been dead meat before anyone realized I was even gone. To give a little context here, for most of my life, I have endeavored to be as rational and scientific as possible, and thus have been skeptical about the supernatural. Then a few years ago, I'm 33 now, 
I came to the realization that I cannot intellectually claim any certitude about whether or not supernatural entities exist, but emotionally, I believe in something. It was a hard thing to come to terms with, actually. I think I had a bit of cognitive dissonance. Rationally, these things do not exist, but I still believe that they do, if that makes any sort of sense. My personal encounters with the ghosts are pretty mild. When I was very young, a door slammed in the basement in a room where my sister, cousin, best friend, and I were playing. We paused, looked at each other with terror-stricken faces, then clamored over each other trying to run upstairs as fast as we could. We all remembered that encounter till this day. Another time, I walked downstairs and saw my deceased grandfather's old rocking chair rocking back and forth. Now, this thing was really, really heavy. And I mean like, it's a rocking chair built from industrial purposes. It had thick, heavy wood and it was rocking back and forth at a full swing. There was no one else in the basement, so I thought that perhaps the cat could be sleeping on it, jumped off, and was hiding somewhere. After all, she did sleep there on occasion. A few months later, I saw my cat jump off the thing. She was on the very edge of the seat, which I imagine would create the most leverage for rocking. It did not budge an inch. But, the story I really wanted to tell you happened to me one day to my friend's dad. Let's call him Vance. Vance? is the quintessential outdoorsman. I would be hard pressed to choose between him or Les Stroud if I ever got lost in the woods and got to choose someone to be lost with me. He is a special needs teacher. Suffice to say, one of the nicest human beings that I've ever had the pleasure of knowing, and I have never known him to lie or even exaggerate. He told the story just like he told his funny stories. He laughed through the whole thing as if he couldn't believe it happened to him. Anyway. In his younger years, he and one of his friends took a job for the Canadian government, where they had to catalog an old ferry wreck in the lake in British Columbia somewhere. Apparently, sometime in the late 1800s, I know, nice and vague, it had sunk and had a bunch of passengers on it that died or something along those lines. I would imagine it was sometime during the gold rush when ramshackle businesses popped out of nowhere. I cannot remember exactly, but I think he said it was Pigeon Lake, not the one in Alberta, but I could be wrong. I did some lazy research and have found that a lake called Pigeon Lake exists in British Columbia, and that's about all. No one seems to live on the lake today, from my satellite views of Google Earth anyway, but there is another lake near it that seems to be a camping spot. I have also failed to find any information regarding a wreck at that point in the time in that area. Anyway, Vance and his friend, who are both certified divers, are driven and boated to the middle of the lake. They were the only ones, as it was secluded and seems to be to this day. The water is a bit murky, but they have flashlights and an alright view of things. They dive down. It may have been so deep that they had to acclimate as not to get bends, but I probably just added that to myself over time. Either way, just as they got their first glimpse of the wreck, like something out of a horror film. A fucking dude swims out of the scariest fuck deaths, rips the breathing nozzle out of Vance's mouth, takes a breath and swims away. Both guys see this and feel this. Vance puts his breathing apparatus back in. Obviously, they look at each other and they're like, what the hell? And then, head for the surface. Initially, their minds went to semi-rational places and they thought someone had come out in another boat. So, they came up, all concerned for this guy who was diving to dangerous deaths. I do believe they actually went back down to catalog the wreck without further incident, because Vance is hardcore like that. Anyway, that story always scared the bejesus out of me. It would freak me out to see a ghost, never mind one at the bottom of a lake. So this story happened to my best friend, who for safety's sake, I plan to call A for now. A and her boyfriend were sitting outside in a truck with another friend. While they were high, none of us had ever seen anything like this before. A saw something moving around outside of the truck and went to brush it off, 
and so one of the others asked if we had all seen it as well. According to them, it looked like a dog, but had red eyes and the head of a jackal, and seemed to be on its legs. Its back two legs, that was. It was moving too fast for a normal dog, and was moving faster than its legs, it seemed. It disappeared for a moment before reappearing on the porch of the friend they were waiting on, K, and it appeared to be eating something. A called K and told her they were leaving, to which K replied, That wasn't any of you guys in the house? A then said she looked up towards the porch and saw her door was wide open. I've been to K's house before and it's not easy to get that door open, so they aren't sure how it happened. Even I got a bad feeling about hearing this. After I got a call late from A asking if I knew anything about demons, since we were both Wiccans. A went back to Kay's house the next day and said that things looked normal, but she could tell things just felt super off. This story happened when I was about 9. I was hiking down a trail with my family. It was my mother, father, my older brothers Bobrov and Roman, and our dog Charger. We were heading down a mountain after a day of hiking in a nice Siberian summer. I want to say it was mid-July, so it was actually fairly nice out. A fun little break from eight months of winter in the following mud season. We were walking down, and the sun was setting quickly that day. So we were about two miles from the bottom before it got dark. And so, we started hearing traditional nightlife start to pop up, such as owls and the like. Nothing too unusual. What struck me as odd, though, was my mother was an old-school Slavic pagan Manzi tribal member. So, she was really into the supernatural scene and she started getting freaked out. She kept saying something was behind us, and then she just kept saying Almas or Almasti which means wow people. And my dad was a soldier in the Spetnaz. He fought in Sheshina, so he was very aware and always kept a gun on him. Initially, he just brushed it off as my mom got scared of the dark. So he held her hand and kept her close, trying to quiet her so she wouldn't worry us. Then, after 20 minutes more, my father just stopped and we all instinctively stopped as well. My father turned to the left looking up a slight slope and said, We are being watched. Get behind me now. So naturally, my brother Roman and I get behind him with my mother and Bobrov stands beside my father. He was 15 and the oldest and bravest. My father hands him a small pistol. I think it was a Makarov and pulls out the sidearm that he carried. Our dog Charger became strange and started smelling like crazy. And then, I noticed a very powerful smell, almost like a wet garbage or dumpster juice, just very foul and offensive to the senses. It almost made my eyes want to water. Charger then begins to bark and runs out of sight, up the slope towards the sinky source. My father, in an unusually cold but commanding manner, demanded, Charger, back now. Charger comes out of the bush and looks at us before taking another step forward. Then we see her get pulled back into the bush. She never yelped or cried, just as she was just gone in a blink. My, my father, at this point, cycled his pistol and held it up ready to fire and commanded we move as a group down the hill now. So we did, and my father, covering up our backs for the whole rest of the way down, we got down safely. I really wish the story ended here. But whatever it was, followed us home. About two nights pass and we are sleeping in our small house. It was essentially a kitchen attached to one big bedroom, like a small old-fashioned log cabin. We were located at the far end of our village, about 500 yards from the nearest house, so a little bit isolated, but not extremely. There were woods all around our house as well. I slept beneath the very small turning window. It was a window that was on a rotating stick in the center, and you could just kind of get a fresh breeze in, but it wasn't very large and it was about two feet above my head. 
I was sleeping next to my little sister, and then it was Roman, Bobrov, and then my parents, all in the same room but separate cots. It was crowded, but I liked having them so close. Turns out, that may be what saved me. It was early in the morning, two or three, and I swear in my sleep, I heard a small creak similar to the one this window made when you opened it. I freaking hated that the window, it always annoyed me. I heard the small creak, and I felt something almost gently tug on my hair on the front bangs on my face. I had kind of a mullet when I was younger. I began to wake up and sat up slightly, thinking perhaps Bobrov was screwing with me like he typically would in the early morning. Before I could think of anything else, I felt a large, violent, and very strong big hand grab my whole face. Two digits were beneath my jaw, so I couldn't even open my mouth to scream. This hand was so large I couldn't see anything in front of me, only my peripheral vision. This strong hand pulled me from my bed and towards the windows, as it was trying to drag me outside. I crowed a loud muffled scream as I kicked violently and tried hitting this thing in the arm. Whatever was holding me, my brother Bobrov held to me by the wrist, and my brother Roman held me by my legs as my sister screamed. I could hear my mother being frantic as my father raced out of the house. I could barely breathe and the foul odor of this monster was filling my lungs. I think I could hear it grunting, but it was hard to tell between the frantic yelling and screaming. Finally, two gunshots break the commotion, the hand drops me to the floor, and I immediately get surrounded by my family when we hear it. The loudest deep roar of pain and anger that terrifies me to this day. It was long and loud and seemed to almost shake the very house. My father gave chase to this beast before it escaped into the woods. My father told us he had hit this creature twice, but it still ran faster than he could have predicted and covered such a distance in a short span of time that it was difficult to hit it in the darkness. He later described it in detail to me. He said it was very broad in the shoulders and walked like a man, but had much more to weight to its steps. He described his face as very flat and heavily defined with a brow ridge and large eyes for nocturnal predators, almost like an owl had thick brown, very coarse hair that covered its whole body, except for the face, kneecaps, and hands. It seemed to stand roughly about seven and a half feet tall and had about 400 pounds of defined muscle to it. My father was a soldier and he had served four active combat tours. He was six foot eight, and this was the only time I remember seeing him in fear. This changed my father profoundly. He became a little less sure of himself and began hanging out with his old army buddies a lot more. Needless to say, all I know is that I was terrified beyond anything, and I don't know what that was. This happened a couple years ago and I still remember it clearly as if it really creeped me out. I grew up in a very strict home. My dad is a preacher and my mom is a workaholic. So you can imagine what I went through in my teen years as I was very rebellious. I was into gangs, drugs, and that sort of thing. I had just gotten out of a nine month county jail stay and had six months in boot camp. So I was very excited to smoke some weed However, I was still on probation, but I had heard about synthetic weed, and it was popular and easily available. This was music to my ears. Weed that can't be detected? Sign me up. Man, how I wish I had known the roller coaster it was going to cause my life. Anyway, so if you smoke synthetic weed, you know it fucks you up pretty bad. My parents started catching on, and soon I had to hide to get high. This was easy because there is a very deep forest behind my house. I would jump the fence and walk until I found a place to sit down and smoke. After about two months of this routine, I was walking the trail that takes me to my favorite spot, when suddenly, I heard something from behind me. As I turn around, I notice that there is a man, a couple of yards away, walking in the same direction as me. I looked to him, and tried not to show any sign that I had been startled by his sudden appearance. This man was tall and looked pretty worn out. He had crappy clothes and looked like he had come from a homeless shelter or something. 
There was something very creepy about how he walked. The stare he had was very disturbing. It felt like he was watching my every move. I could feel his fierce stare even while he was behind me. I turned to look at him and he didn't even blink, just stared. I nodded in respect and kept walking. I had just finished boot camp, so I was ready to defend myself. I am also very paranoid. I couldn't stand the fact that this stranger was behind me, so I turned around to look at him. He asked, Are you okay? In a mocking kind of tone, probably sensing my discomfort. I said, Yeah. Awkward. I noticed that even if I slowed down walking, he was making sure he stayed behind me. I even stepped off the side and pretended to text to watch him pass by, and he walked even slower in a very obvious way. He just kept staring with an evil look in his eye, kind of like annoyed that I would even try to outsmart him. He was expecting me to run. He kept following me and staring at me. I probably should have turned around as much as, but I just was too scared and I just didn't know what the hell this guy was doing. What really bothered me was that he had his sleeves rolled up and was getting closer like he was planning to do something. I played a very desperate move. I stopped in my tracks and said very loud, Did you hear that? I pulled out my butterfly knife and started into the woods to our side. He suddenly stopped and we both stood there in silence, just waiting there. I turned to face him, motioning him to be quiet. I acted like I heard an animal or something. I shrugged it off and said, Ha, huh, probably a pig or something. I kept the knife open in my hand like that as I walked, because all of the stalling and walking in the pretty deep woods now, I couldn't afford to turn back now. I noticed he was keeping his distance, still staring at me with a very mean look. Then he was gone. I was so creeped out that I walked with the knife and just kept checking behind me. Finally, I felt pretty safe. However, I was a bit too far into the woods that I knew if I smoked that synthetic weed, I'd have to have to go all the way back really high. At least, it was still daylight, because trust me, I smoked back there at night. I know, how stupid. Anyway, I decided to take the main trail that ejects you into the far end of the neighborhood. All the other trails end up who knows where. I knew about a clearing where I was going to smoke, then walk back to my house, through the neighborhood to play it safe. As I approached the clearing, my stomach dropped. One of the trunks was the man sitting there. What the fuck? How did he beat me here? But the thing that really bothered me was that he had something like a pickaxe or an axe. He was just sitting there. I watched him to see if he was chopping a tree or something. Nope, just talking to himself, rocking back and forth like a crazy person. I watched him trying to figure him out. He hadn't seen me, so I was very quiet. My knife was no match for that weapon that he had. I'd have to fight him. As all this was going through my head, he got up, grabbed an axe, and walked in my direction. I don't think he heard me. I just think it was bad timing. Fuck this shit. I took off running, and not once did I look back. Once I left the trail and went to the woods to jump my house, I ran through those woods cutting and scraping my arms and face on the way and just not caring. That incident spooked me so much that I did not go back until about three months later, and I always carried something more effective than a knife, if you know what I mean. I'm a 17 year old male who lives in a small town in the middle of a forested area. I have had a bunch of things that have happened to me, but the story I'm about to share has haunted me and my friend for many years. And since the following is going to be a few different events, I'm going to tell them in the order that they happened, over a time span of 4 months. I'm an exploring kind of person. I love horror and rush of adrenaline. I believe in the paranormal and I have a close friend who does the same. We spend a lot of time together, out walking on old railroad tracks and talking about life, just winding down. We're really close and I see him as my brother. 
considering how we've known each other our entire lives. Let's just call him W, just to simplify things. There's this old hospital that lies on the outskirts of town, just by the woods. It's been shut down for probably 60 plus years now, and it's been pretty much abandoned. Me and W usually cross the place when we're on our walks and often end up just talking about it and all the rumor it has, since supposedly people have died there both before and after it shut down, and it's rumored that it was a mental asylum as well, so it's a pretty creepy area. For the following to make sense, I'm going to explain how the place is laid out. Picture a lower capital M. The top part is where the entrance is. The back is where the three wings are leaving two gaps between the wings. It was a late summer night, and the sun had just started to set. Our summer break was almost over, and the night had started to get a lot more darker this time around. We were circling this place, which wasn't as easy as you'd think. There's a lot of scrap and old tires, and a lot of other stuff laying around. And since this place was unkept, we were walking around in waist-high grass. We were just joking around, trying to scare ourselves by sharing thoughts about how someone was probably living in there, staring at us. But that fantasy surely got more intriguing when we started to knock on a door we found, just cause we could. As we both went silent, we heard a knock come from inside. This got us quite interested, as we aren't easily scared. We stuck around, knocking on different locations, and at times, heard knocks back, usually in the set of three in a rapid succession. That was what got us hooked in the first place, so we kept coming back, and finally decided to try to find a way inside. One night, we found an old porch that was on the back of this place, between two of the wings that had been there and abandoned. We were having a hushed conversation as the activity of the place had picked up, and trying to discuss how we were going to get up there and just decided that we were going to try to find this old fire ladder that was hanging about three meters off the ground. It was on the other wing, and as we were going up, we both heard something. The sounds of footsteps in the grass. Note that the two of us were standing in one of the corners inside the gap, so we had one way out, and that was towards the corner of the building. We both went quiet, and both turned our head towards the corners that led out to the high unkept grass. And just as we did, the sound stopped. Whatever it was, you could hear that it was bipedal. And it was definitely trying to sneak up on us while we were talking. And it was just around the corner. We looked at each other, and W said following the exact words to me after barely a second of processing, said, Leg it! And we did. We ran to the opposite end of the opening, expecting to see something or someone following us when we came into the clearing, but we didn't. But that didn't stop us from running. But the one thing that stopped me was when W, who was right behind me, tripped and on an old tire and fell into the high grass. Luckily, he wasn't hurt, so after he got up, we took quick off again, and just before jogging the hell out of there, we looked back into the woods to see what seemed to be eyes glowing and looking back at us. We kept going there and following what happened a late afternoon during the fall as we had just planned that we were going to go in. Considering the ladder was unreachable from the ground, we were planning on our next visit. The ladder went up to the roof to the three-story tall building and went right past a window which was missing the frame and glass. So if you got up, you could easily just slip inside by stretching out your foot. We were standing at the bottom, looking up at the window, and since the building had a risk of having the floor collapse, we were going to th throw something up there through the window to see if we could hear it land on the floor. And since you'd be able to tell if it fell down one story, the following is a small detail which became horrifying to us later on. You could see the stairs just barely through the window from our angle. I had just picked up a piece of wood and thrown it through the window. And sure enough, we heard it land on the floor. But, barely two seconds after the first thud, we also heard two thuds from the stairs, as if someone was walking down. As if something came to see what had made the noise. This creeped us out a bit, so we stuck around a while before starting to decide that we were going to leave for the day. 
when we heard something from out in the woods, which sounded like something drifting or burning rubber with a car. Th this wasn't impossible, considering how people recently started to get their driver's license and wanted to act tough in their old beat up Volvos. W seemed to be a bit skeptical, and I did as well, as that noise kept on going for at least 20 seconds flat. If it was something burning rubber, they wouldn't be doing it for that long. And it also stopped so abruptly, like it just cut off, before continuing for maybe about five or 10 more seconds. But that made me so sure it wasn't someone acting cool, was the fact that it started sounding more like human with time, like a girl just screaming. But for that long and that loud? We got way too unnerved to stick around when we started hearing the rustling in the woods, so we left for that day. And the following is the last visit we ever made to that place. It was a rainy autumn night. It was quite dark and we were heading out there again. We were decently prepared with flashlights, a rope, and gloves to give us a better grip and fully charged phones. The plan was to use the thick rope he had brought, which had a small loop on the end, to get around one of the bottom steps of the ladder, and then pull the rope through the loop so we could climb up and reach the ladder. It took us about 15 minutes to get the rope up and around, and also down and get the rope secured. This whole time, we were felt watched and unnerved, like something didn't want us there. We felt trapped like something was going to come running at us from behind, our only exit. The cold rain made the climb up hard, as we were getting rigid and the rope was slippery, but I got up, and the moment I did, I felt isolated for some reason. The climb to the window was probably a few meters, which meant that if I fell, I could seriously injure myself, on either all the broken glass or the old scrap. But what terrified me the most was the moment I stepped inside. It was pitch black and this overwhelming weight came over me, and I felt weak in my entire body. Shining the flashlight along, I saw old needles, dark brownish spots on the floor and walls, a bloody rag, and rusty old stairs. Also, there were two long hallways on both to the left and right that seemed to go on forever. Something my mom was convincing me not to turn around and look down the hall, because if I did, I could tell. It was not out of fear that I would see something terrible. I did my best to try to get W up to climb up and join me, but he refused, and I don't blame him. I didn't stay in there very long. I soon climbed down and we left, leaving the rope. I felt dread stuck in me with fur. It just felt like days. I couldn't stop feeling this, this creepy feeling. It's never left me, and I always feel like something is following me. This was last year and it still haunts us. I started wanting to go back there, to go back inside, but W refuses to go back to that place again. Doing some research, I came to the conclusion of it being a demon that has latched on to me, as they apparently want to get to their victims, back to the place that they latched on to get stronger. I've also went back there during the daylight a few times. Mm -hmm. And I tried to collect the rope, but it was clean cut right where the loop was, leaving a small knot. I remember that it was roughly three to four meters up in the air, and the cut was pretty much a perfect one. We still talk about this, and sometimes see lights in the window of that old place when we pass at night. The power was shut down over feared 50 years ago, so this is, this is really weird. My father used to enjoy going to this campground, not far from the hometown he grew up in. The campground was in Cavendish, Vermont. It was called Catton Place. He enjoyed how peaceful and remote the area was, having been there a few times and observing that it was family friendly. He thought it would be nice to bring his daughter with him. Choosing to go the same time of year that he went the last few times, he saw familiar faces. 
There was this campsite of three men who were out of staters in their 40s. Most likely, they were from Boston because of their accent. They had a big fancy trailer and the entire site was decked out with a dartboard, hammock, lawn chairs, garden gnomes, and patches of fake grass. From observation, it looks like they stayed there a couple of weeks at a time. All settled in and quite comfortable. Too comfortable, actually. To the point that they walked around with a sense of superiority, boastful and loud. They acted like they owned the place. The place was actually run by an elderly couple. These macho acting goons were quite friendly with them. The year before, they painted the playground for them for free. So, the elderly couple loved these guys. My father saw these men around last time, but didn't have to deal with them or worry much because their camp was situated far apart from them. This time, unfortunately, we were placed quite close to them, with only one empty campsite separating us. We were surrounded by other campsites too, but about 30 feet away, there was a middle-aged couple camping out as well. Here is where the story starts. We arrived and set up our camp. I remember observing those men across from us. My father waved a friendly hello to them, and they waved back. Throughout the day, I played on the playground. By nighttime, we roasted hot dogs and marshmallows. Meanwhile, those macho goons across the way were partying hard. Booze everywhere and blaring tunes on the radio. Lots of laughs and bickering, too. We didn't pay much attention or look over that way. We just kept to ourselves. Tired yawns, we crawled into our tents and tried to go to sleep, but all the ruckus was still going on. I was able to fall asleep, but my father was not. He lay there for a few hours and kept checking the time occasionally. It was getting closer to midnight, and he wondered if the middle-aged couple nearby were having trouble sleeping over this noise too. Then, the sound could be heard of a vehicle coming down the road. It was the elderly man who owns the place. He stops and lets the men know there's been a noise complaint. The men apologize profusely and say they'll be settling into their sleep soon. The owner leaves. They immediately start cussing and throwing things around their campsite as the owner was out of sight. They were offended that somebody had reported them. Who do you think did it? One of the others asked. Well, it's either the guy and the little girl next to us or the couple over there. The other guy responds. Third guy adds, I didn't see any of them leaving their car to go to the front desk. So one of these people must have a cell phone. This was 1997 or 1998. So cell phones weren't as common back then. These men began conspiring to figure out who owns the cell phone. They weren't trying hard to speak in a hushed tone because my father could hear everything. I bet it's the asshole the Cadillac who owns the cell phone. I'm going over there, one of them says. They're talking about my father. He does not have a cell phone though. The feeling of pure fear came over him. He has no idea what's going to happen and needs to think fast. The sound of stumbling footsteps come right up just inches away from our tent. What to do, what to do. My dad thought of making a noise, any noise, and he grabbed the soda can next to him flick the top with his fingers and this guy started and takes a step backwards. He then scurries away back to his drunk buddies. They are now whispering amongst themselves. He can't pick up on what they're saying but catches the part where they're saying that they're going to try again later. He wonders if he heard that right. What the hell are these guys trying to do? There's no way my father is going to try to fall asleep now. In fact, he's not feeling tired at all hopped up on so much adrenaline right now from the fear. Man, with his daughter, feeling helpless. Only a soda can and a flashlight to protect us. My dad lays there frozen, listening, listening, listening. Hoping these guys would just give it up and just sleep off their drunk craziness. A short time passes and they hear the footsteps again. Their campfire is so bright that it casts a shadow into our tent. He can literally see the shadow of the man coming towards us. The man doesn't get as close as this time because, again, he stops at the noise coming from our tent. My dad had unzipped his sleeping bag in a panic, ready to defend and protect us, just in case the man was going to try to come in our tent. The man is not moving anymore. He's just standing there watching us. My dad remembered he had a lighter in his pocket, so he took it out and from underneath the blanket flicked the switch on. He was just hoping it would mimic the sound of a gun getting ready. I don't think it worked, but the man eventually did turn around 
and go back to his campsite. You won't believe this. They're still awake. What the fuck? They all sputtered against themselves. Maybe just maybe being around 2.30 a.m. now, they will finally go to sleep. Nope. At this point, I'm still sleeping. But I'm tossing and turning a lot. My feet slap against the side of the tent, and a couple of times, and the footsteps are approaching us again. While I brush my feet against the side of the tent, Ah, the man says with an exasperated sigh. He starts to walk away, but not to his campsite. He walks towards the road, walks a few feet, stops, and screams at the top of his lung. If I find out who reported us, I will kill you. You hear me? I will fucking kill you. Everything is still now. Only sounds that can be heard is the crackling of the campfire and the occasional indistinct chatter amongst the men. Then, finally, the sound of their trailer door shutting at 5 a.m. They're asleep. My dad lays there trying to process everything that has happened. By 6 a.m., he wakes me up to pack up and get out of there. I remember him rushing me, and I was a little confused. My dad then said he's never going camping again, and that statement is still true. He's never been camping since. When I was young, I was one of those kids who was all about being outdoors. I was in the Boy Scouts as soon as I was old enough to join and stayed in until I was 18. In Boy Scouts, there is a group called the Order of the Arrow, or OA. To my young mind, it was like the special forces of scouting, and I was so excited when I was told I had been selected to join their prestigious ranks. So, I packed my bags and went to camp at Dale Wrestler, New Mexico, and I was ready to see what I would have to do to become an OA. To join OA, you have to go through a trial weekend. I will say not much more of that because the trials that we had to go through are secret. The last night though, we were split up into groups of four, given map coordinates, a compass, and a bare bone minimum of what we would need and told to survive for the night and then to report to a second set of coordinates in the morning. Myself and the three scouts started on our way and we were hiking for about five hours before we found a small clearing and confirmed it was our camping spot. From the northeast to the east, there was a thick thorny bramble. We tried to find a way to explore it, but the waist-high vines were impossible to get through without something to cut them. So we ignored it and went on just exploring a bit around the camp and goofing off. As night came, we all started to set down and to make a fire. This would be our only source of light for the night. We stayed up for a bit after dark, chatting and telling stupid jokes, and just having fun, talking before we went to bed. We had one small tent, and so myself and one of the other scouts slept outside near the fire, while the other two slept inside. I don't remember the time, because none of us had packed a watch, but it was well after the fire had gone out. I was shaken awake by one of the other scouts. He whispered in a quiet voice that would sometimes crack with fear. Th th there's someone outside our campsite. He then pointed up. Moving from north to east outside the clearing was a bright blue ball of light. The odd thing was, the core was bright, but did not seem to cast a light on the trees. It was more like glowing than producing light per se. I stared at it nervously and curious as he quietly belly crawled and woke the other two up. It is just some other group messing around, one of the other scouts said as he rubbed the sleep from his eyes, not trying to be quiet like the first one or I had. The light didn't seem to do anything different from its motions as the fourth scout said, but wait, that is where the bramble is. It was then that we realized how smooth the light was moving and how dead quiet the forest around us was. Nothing was making a noise, and not even the moving light. I watched it for some time before accidentally falling asleep again. When I woke up, everyone else was already packing to make it to the rendezvous point. They said 
that whatever it was last night made them feel scared, and I was the only one to sleep after seeing it. The rest had remade the fire before it faded away, and they stayed up on watch. Sadly, this is where the excitement of the story ends. We packed up and made it to the point without incident. Before I start the story, let me give you a little insight on myself. I grew up in a very military strict family. From the moment I turned five, my dad taught me everything I know now, from fighting to survival skills. My dad being an ex-Navy SEAL, nothing really scares me. I'm not trying to paint myself as the most fearless person in the world, but I am also a paranormal investigator. Not something I talk about at work, but, after having my fair share of experiences, I grew to love it, and it always interested me. So, from putting away some of the worst people in the world, and my fair share of seeing the creepiest shit, nothing honestly scares me. This story takes place several summers ago. Two of my friends, Craig and Justin, Justin also being in law enforcement, and the other, a firefighter, decided to go camping. I always felt so comfortable in the woods. As I said, my dad taught me everything I know. We would spend days in the woods just living off the land. My friend knew of a very remote area up in New Hampshire. I don't recall the location. I was actually really excited because I hadn't been camping in years. It took us some time to find a good spot to get a good idea of the area. I felt like we were in another planet entirely. We set up our tents, gathered up some firewood, and all of us had brought MREs to eat. We sat around talking for what felt like hours. We all grew pretty tired and decided to head to bed. I settled into my tent and quickly passed out. I was awoken by probably 3am to this horrible feeling. The only way to explain it is the need to fight or I was about to die. Now, I always carry a gun on me, my Beretta 92S. It really never leaves my side. I sat up and looked around my tent. It was small enough that there wasn't much space. Here's the creepy part. I remember my father used to tell me to listen to the woods. The animals and night crawlers, they will go silent if something's wrong. You won't hear a single thing. And that's it. I heard nothing. The first time in my life I felt fear. I have had my fair share of demonic hauntings and this doesn't even come close. I peered out of the tent. We had set the tent up on a good elevation facing an open field, about a hundred yards or so away. Mind you, it was full moon and bright as heck. Something was standing there. I can only begin to describe this thing as a mammal half lizard thing. The best way I can describe it is that it looked like half of the body of a horse. It had a lizard-like face, and what I can only describe as spikes coming from the back, and one hell of a set of teeth. At first, I seriously thought someone was in a costume messing with us, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was getting from this thing. An unearthly one. I did notice it, looks, it, it was looking at something. I couldn't make out what kind of animal it was but it was probably the size of a raccoon. It looked like it was trying to sneak by, but the animal just randomly fell on its side and just let this thing take it. I was absolutely terrified. I knew if this thing headed our way, no 9mm is going to do anything to it. I could even hear it breathing all the way from my tent. What only sounds like something breathing through pudding. I crawled to my friend's tent keeping a low profile. In a small relief I noticed my friend Craig was also awake. He was looking at the same thing I was. We waited as the thing just stood there looking around. Then it started to make its way for the tree lines. We could hear it smashing through the trees and then silence. Craig and I just laid there for what felt like hours until the sun came up. Still, absolutely terrified. Justin woke up, of course he heard nothing and not believing a single word of what we said. We packed up that day, and I have never been back to those woods. I seriously was always afraid to tell this story. 
I'll probably be sent for a psych evaluation, and I don't care, because I am not making this crap up. I'm a 17-year-old male, living in the Midwest. My sophomore year of high school, my friends peer pressured me into joining the track team. I thought that this was a good idea, because I wanted to improve my stamina. So, due to this fact, I was asked to join the long distance track team. To practice, our small team would run in the woods, and then to a lake. These woods are mostly used for off-road biking, so we would run in the forest in the dirt paths that the bikes would make. After school, we would run in these woods every day. Time to time, we saw deer. These deer would get very close, so much so, that one would only need to take three or four feet to maybe even pet one. These woods were fun to run in because they could be so secluded. The last day I ran in these woods, it was just another day. Due to my poor stamina, I was pretty far behind the rest of the group and I had produced a fairly painful side cramp. In fact, I stopped to take a breather. Let me give you a layout of the path I was on. The bike path is cut into a slope, dividing it into two parts. The upper half is surrounded in trees, and above that is just more woods. The other half of the slope leads to ponds and more woods. As I was admiring the nature, I heard a loud snap high up in the woods. And so many scary stories, people say they get that feeling where they feel dread or the hair on their neck stands up. This feeling is very real, as I got this feeling. Turning around, I accepted to see deer, yet, to my utter horror, I saw a man. The man was pretty far away, but I saw his jeans and long sleeve checkered shirt. A bit of background on myself, I am currently a third degree black belt in Taekwondo, going on 15 years of practicing martial arts. Still, with my knowledge of self-defense, I was put off and began a light jog. To my utter horror, the man began to sprint down the hill. The creepiest part of his sudden sprint was how he used the trees to propel himself. I suddenly realized why he was running. He was trying to cut me off. Realizing I could not outrun him, I said a silent prayer as I ripped off an old stick of a fallen tree. The man finally made it down the hill. I was face to face with what I believe was a homeless man. The smell was very pungent. His eyes were bloodshot and he had unkept a beard. I warned him to fuck off and I raised the stick. The man smiled and said words I will never forget. All I want to do is play. At this comment, I closed the distance, delivering a kick into his groin. He moaned and began to stumble. I brought down the stick as hard as I could, breaking it over his head. The man fell on the path. With utter fear in my heart, I ran as hard and as fast as I could. My coach was waiting for me at the end of the forest path. She could see that I looked fearful and asked me what was wrong. I smiled weakly and told her nothing, and I decided not to tell my coach anything because I didn't think she'd believe me. After a few days, I decided to tell my parents, who immediately told me to tell my coach. I told her the next practice, and we did not run in those woods again. To this day, over a year later, I still have decided not to enter those woods. In the fall of 2016, a friend and I decided to go hiking late in the afternoon in a densely wooded wilderness area in the mountains not far from Fayetteville, Arkansas. My friend Rick was close to 60 at the time and recovering from a triple bypass he had undergone around 16 months earlier. We had been hiking these trails for about a year following his operation to strengthen his cardiovascular health. That day, a weekday, I hiked with a bottle of water, my wallet, and my keys, but nothing else. Nothing to protect myself. The trail we picked is a popular weekend hiking spot that we had taken dozens of times before. We were both comfortable with the hike and had never had a problem on that path, or any other for that matter. While Rick is older, and at the time a little more feeble after his health problems, I was in my mid-40s, 
well over six feet tall, and in pretty good shape. So, I wasn't really very worried about our safety. The trail we were on is on a state park adjacent to Federal Park land. It's an outdoors enthusiast dream. Most of our trek that day was completely uneventful. We just enjoyed the autumn leaves and chatted casually as the sun dropped lower in the evening sky. We had seen nobody else that day, which was probably to be expected given that we chose to hike late on a weekday. We'd completed about four miles of the six mile loop up to that point, and it was as uneventful as any other. On our way back to the car, and about two miles from park area, we spotted someone. Through an opening in the trees, I saw a young woman, probably a college student. She was on the trail ahead of us, and moving in our direction. At first glance, I paid her very little attention, as the distance between us disappeared, that changed. I did not know her, so I could not have mistaken, but there was something about her posture and expression that just seemed off. As she got closer, it struck me that she had some semi-panicked look on her face and was moving quite quickly. But she was in athletic gear, so maybe she was just doing some cardio or something. She occasionally turned her head and stared over her shoulder. I followed her eyes and eventually noted that another woman about 50 yards behind her was walking up the path through the trees. The second woman was not wearing hiking gear. In fact, her clothing struck me as totally inappropriate. It was a warm afternoon, and we were all well inside a wooded state park area for miles away from any homes, but she was wearing semi-formal, offish casual attire and a light jacket. I thought the clothes must have been secondhand because they were tattered and ill-fitting, and they definitely didn't look washed. She was a fit, athletic-looking woman, who couldn't have been more than 25 or 30 years of age. It was too bizarre. The clothes were wrong for the trail, and they were wrong for the age. Everything about her was off. Her shoes struck me as being even more peculiar. When she got closer, I noticed she was wearing scuffed, leather flats, casual shoes with no ankle support. I found it completely odd, because you just don't see people on this trail just as she was, and you never see them wearing shoes like that. My hiking partner, Rick, hadn't appeared to notice anything odd, as he was completely involved in the conversation and just kept talking. The second woman briefly glanced up, and we made eye contact as she neared us. The alarm bells were going off in my head. There was something in her eyes that made me feel uncomfortable. I don't know what she was thinking, if I'm being honest, but I swear she had contempt in her face. Part of me wondered whether I'd be offending her by staring, so I diverted my eyes and kept walking. I tried to tell myself that maybe she was homeless. Maybe she was wearing the only thing she had, and I was just being rude. But the warning bells were still going off in my head. I'm not a paranoid person, so having my sixth sense going off like that was very unsettling. I have a fantastic peripheral vision, so I turned my face toward Rick and acted like I was listening to him, but I was watching the creepy woman out of the corner of my eye. The moment we passed, she spun her head around to study us, and she slowed her pace. My internal alarms grew louder. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her come to a stop and drop her face toward at the ground. Her body half turned on the trail. It was very odd behavior. Rick and I kept walking around 50 yards further. We made it around a bend in the path and I looked back at the woman before the trees obscured her view. She was still standing there. Her face was down, but she was staring a hole through us out of the corner of her eyes. That was the first time I realized that I couldn't see her hands. One was inside her jacket pocket, and the other was hidden from my view on the other side of her body. It creeped the hell out of me. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. For half a mile, I didn't see her again, and had begun to wonder whether the first woman, the co-ed, had felt danger as well. Clearly she had, I thought, and that's why she was practically running through the woods at dusk. It also struck me that the woman was stopping and studying Rick and me, like she was deciding on whom to follow. We weren't moving as fast, we were walking as quickly as Rick could manage, 
and he was clearly more female than a co-ed. But those thoughts amped my senses and I felt very uneasy, so I periodically checked behind us. At certain points through the woods, I could see more than 100 yards and nothing. I began to worry about the co-ed. My hair stood up for a second time as I felt the strongest sensation of being watched. Again, thinking I was paranoid and half mocking myself for being afraid of the creepy woman, I turned my head around to assure myself she was not back there. I was wrong. She was there, following with her head down and moving briskly about a hundred yards behind us, but with her hands hidden. I turned my head back to the trail in front of us and kept walking, still trying to convince myself that there was nothing out of the ordinary happening that I was just being rude because she was dressed like a homeless woman. About 200 yards further along the path, I turned my head back to Rick and my heart raced a bit. She had closed half the distance. Each time we walk around a bend in the woods obscured her location, she would emerge closer and closer to us. I told myself that I was just being paranoid, but, but nevertheless, I tried to get Rick to pick up the pace. By this time, he was clearly aware that we were being followed, and he was pretty uncomfortable as well. Though, to his credit, he did keep walking. With half a mile to go before we reached the parking area, I turned my head once again, and she was just ten feet behind us. I hadn't seen or heard her get that close, and it freaked me out. I literally jumped. One of her hands was in her pockets, and the other was behind her back. I got the distinct feeling she had a weapon of some kind, and that she had no fear of despite the fact that I was considerably taller, albeit several years older. There was no mistaking her demeanor. She meant to do us harm, or at the very least she intended to intimidate us. I weaved my car keys between my knuckles. I handed my water bottle to Rick, and made an obvious fist with my left hand. With a half mile left in our hike, I thought to myself, if this is nothing, She'll pass us and move on, as clearly she's moving a lot faster than we are. I was accustomed to people overtaking us, but she didn't pass, and never acted like she knew we were there, which was the creepiest part. I kept my head toward turned her, as I walked and tried to get her to make eye contact, but she didn't look me in the eyes at first. She kept acting like neither Rick nor I were on the path a few feet ahead of her and she'd followed so closely behind. I was completely unnerved, and that made me angry. I wanted her to see how pissed I was and to convey with a look that messing with me was a mistake. When she finally did make eye contact with me, I glared and clenched my fist. There was an instant where I couldn't read her expression. She was simply blank. But as she studied my face, she appeared simultaneously agitated and a little less confident. I was conveying one thing on my face. Back the fuck off. And at this point, I didn't give a damn if it appeared rude. She apparently thought better of whatever she was doing and slowed her pace so that the distance between us grew to about 20 feet. But she was tense and kept whatever she had in her hand hidden behind her. I never saw her hands. I knew she had a weapon though, and I believe she meant to do us harm, but I also know she recognized that I was ready to fight. I was mentally prepared to charge at her if I saw a gun or a knife, as I knew Rick couldn't outrun her. I thought to myself, I just have to surprise her. I also realized that I needed to have her in front of us. A few hundred feet further, about a quarter mile away from where our car was parked, she still was stalking us and I had enough. I was in equal measures afraid and furious. I told Rick that we were going to stop and let her pass, loud enough for her to hear it. Just as I was getting ready to stop on the trail and make her walk in front of us, she veered into a small clearing, plowing through waist-high brush, crossed a ditch and scurried through a tree line to a road that ran through the woods in between the main road and the parking area. I kept my eyes on her the entire time. She had a car. It was parked alongside the little service road, partially hidden by shrubs, not in the parking lot. The last time we made eye contact just before she climbed in her car, it was clear from the expression on her face that she was very angry. I glared at her, 
expressing my own anger, and kept walking. When her car started and she drove away, Rick got quiet before asking me, what in the hell was she doing? Did she have a gun? I told him I didn't know. I never saw a weapon. We walked back to our car without saying another word. Once the engine was on and the doors were shut, we chatted a bit more and decided to call the authorities and report the incident and to make sure to have them check the poor co-ed who had passed first. To this day, I have no idea what the creepy woman was planning to do. I don't know if she wanted to rob us, harm us, scare us, I have no idea. I am just thankful she decided better of it. I have hiked that trail more than 50 times since then, but I've never seen her again. I live in northern New South Wales, Australia, in an area where the bush is quite dense. Now, I've always been into the paranormal and have experienced a few situations that just cannot be explained. The one I'm about to tell is the most freakiest one so far. So, here's a backstory that links into the story I'm about to tell. So, I live with my parents and my two brothers. About a year back, we were staying with some friends in a tiny desert town with a population of 200. I know, it is very tiny. We heard about an older man who lived in one of the houses and was murdered about four years back. The locals suspected the murderer to be a dodgy, dirty homeless man who was lingering around the children and just being completely and utterly creepy, so they kicked him out of the town. This man had a tattoo on his forehead saying, Mom. Now, fast forward to when we were camping in the bush. We went for a drive on a day that I was going to have a shower in a place where you paid about two bucks for a shower if you were camping close by. Anyway, we parked and noticed a man with a small puppy trying to hitchhike. Me being a nice person, decided to ask him where he was going and let him know my father could probably drive him. Now, when I sit in my back passenger seat, it sometimes looks like I'm the one driving. So, I'm assuming he thought I was alone, as he seemed perfectly fine at first, but then hesitant when he noticed our Rottweiler and the rest of my family. They gave him a lift while I had my shower. I don't know why, but I got a bad feeling. They took a little bit longer than usual. They came back in shock. It was the same fucking man with a tattoo on his head from that small town. We coincidentally bumped into this possible killer who was last seen in a complete different state four years ago. He was wearing a hat when I spoke to him, so I didn't see the tattoo. My parents told me how crazy bad the vibes were and how quiet everyone was. They even stopped and dropped him off at a public spot so they did not feel that safe at all with him. Now, we are driving back to the camp and we're cracking jokes about how we would be waiting back at the camp for us with coffee. My family was terrible with a sense of humor. We got to the camp at light at night and it was dark. We had two big tents and we slept in a big kitchen tent. I was somehow still in a bit shaken sense, but I somehow decided to grab a knife and put it next to my bed. You know, just in case. I was cleaning off my knife when I heard something walking behind the tent. I called out to my little brother and he replied that he was in the campfire with everyone else including the dog. I suddenly became very frightened and without even thinking looked next to me inside the food tent and the only way I can describe it was that I seen this old, dirty man crouching down in the dark, breathing heavily and looking me dead in the eyes. I froze for a second and screamed like I have never before and I began running to everyone else. I was getting ready to call the police but once my dad walked in with a huge dick, it was like he just vanished. It was just like, it didn't make sense. There was so much food in that tent that no one could have really been in it without crushing everything. Plus, nothing was even moved when we looked inside. When things settled down and we couldn't find anything around, we eventually all tried going to sleep. After about 10 minutes of trying to sleep and still horrified from whatever the fuck I had just seen, I started hearing footsteps around the tent. It went on for about five minutes. I listened very carefully. This thing had two feet and it sounded heavy and big. To try and possibly scare it off, I told my brother very loudly to grab the knife and see what's outside. Everyone else admitted to hearing it also. My dog started barking and followed my brother outside. 
She then chased whatever it was into the forest. My brother couldn't see it, but he said it was running our dog, and it sounded as if it were dragging something heavy. After about 15 minutes, we tried going back to sleep. Just before I managed to get some sleep, a voice from outside very faintly said my dog's name. My dog didn't make a sound for the rest of the night. Now, I don't know if this had absolutely anything to do with that day, but I fell asleep that night and my face towards the tarp wall. I had the craziest, vivid nightmare. I'll try to explain the nightmare as I can. It was like I was face to face with an autopsy of a young blonde American girl. She was speaking into my ear, going into details about how she was murdered, how her body was found, and how good her life was beforehand. I tried looking away from the body, but everywhere I turned my head, I was just looking at a different part of the body while she still spoke. This dream went on until she said a name of a man, and then I woke up. I don't remember the name, and it was not familiar to me. Anyway, that was probably the scariest, strangest night I have ever experienced, and I no longer enjoy camping. I hope you enjoyed my story as much as I enjoy listening to everyone else's experiences. This story happened to me when I was hiking in the woods. It was about 3 a.m., so there was no light yet. There is rarely people up there, and there are no trails. It's mostly trees and hills and wild cows. I was walking down a hill, and I thought, why not do some exploring? So, I decided to go down a few more hills until I was on flat ground. I looked around and saw what looked like a trailer. I decided to go into it. I had my gun in my hand just in case some crazy bear or something tried to kill me. Anyway, when I was inside the trailer, I nearly threw up. It smelled like sulfur, but extremely bad. I walked further into it and saw a bed, a bag, and some books on black magic. Then I left because I couldn't stand that smell anymore. I left the trailer and continued walking. I came across a house, well, maybe a bit bigger. I was like, why not go in there? And so, I went in. I saw the same books, and I was kind of creeped out. Then I went upstairs and saw that there was some stuff on the second floor. I heard something move, and I got a terrible feeling of bad energy. Then, I decided to yell for whatever reason at whoever was up there. I said, I know you're up there, motherfucker. Say something. But, there was complete silence. I shot my gun through the roof and, this time, heard a scuffle. The sun had started rising now, so I decided it was best to leave. Before I left, I saw something written on the stair. It said, House of Spirits. I booked it out of there, and I felt the same feeling of being watched and scared. I turned around and there was a man on the roof. He was staring at me. He had a long beard and long hair. He was smiling at me, and I felt so disturbed. I shot at the man and yelled at him, but he kept smiling. I ran back to keep an eye on him, and I booked it into the truck. I always see that man around town, but I guess he doesn't recognize me. A few years have passed and my father's friends know him. He is always at the library. He gives everyone bad vibes and stuff, but I'm lucky to be alive. He was a devil worshipper and could have killed me, and no one would have known where to find our car. Anyway, I won't be going near their house again. This happened about two to three years ago. I live in northwestern Montana, and it was my senior year summer. And I was going through some personal stuff that year, and I thought the best way to escape from that was to get off the grid and go camping in the forest. My plan was to go on a hiking trail that not a lot of people hike on, and get to this small campsite. I packed my gear that everyone brings on hiking trips, food, water, tents, bear spray, etc. When I left, it was after work and it took a couple hours to reach the beginning of the trail. The hike was 10 miles into the forest which had winding paths, rocky areas, and thick and overgrown brush that at times was hard to see the trail because of how overgrown the trail has been with the lack of people taking it. The trail just led you deeper into the mountains. The hike was pretty uneventful until I reached the campground. 
When you come out of the trail into the campground, the first thing you see is a small open area about 30 to 50 feet, just, just enough to hold a couple tents. And when you look in front, you can see a small lake with trees packed together tight, and it's hard to see through right above the Rocky Mountains, sticking up high in position to where the sun goes over. The surrounding area is covered in pine trees, making it hard to see more than 20 feet in front of you. When I reached the campground, I set up my tent right away because the sun was going down fast in the mountains. When I reached the campground, I set up my tent right away because the sun was going down fast, and with the mountains there, it grew dark quick, and since I have had nothing to eat, I got a fire going and put some food on. And here's where it starts to begin. Nightfall came. The night was calm, and just a small breeze was coming to make the trees just move enough to where it starts to make kirokig noises. The night was pretty chilly, and I made a pretty good fire. About an hour into the night, I got this foul smell that just seemed to linger around. It must have been coming from the wind, is what I thought anyway. But the smell was strong, and felt like it was right next to me. I threw another log on the fire. And then I hear the scream of what sounded like a woman next to me coming from the direction where the wind was coming from. At least, I think. It freaked the hell out of me, because I thought I was the only person up here. I didn't see any other tents, and there's no place to set up tents other than the spot I'm in. And the scream didn't come from the trail I came from. The visibility that night came from the campfire and the moon reflecting off the lake, so I couldn't see far. But... I reached into my backpack and pulled out a flashlight and just slowly started scanning the area for a woman. I yelled back, Are you okay? What's wrong? And the woman yelled back, Help me! So, I said, Where are you? Are you hurt? Trying to find the source of the sound, there was a small pause and then she yelled back, Come here! But there was something off about the voice. I just kept thinking to myself, that woman didn't sound like she was hurting or anything was really attacking her. So that raised a red flag in my mind, and everything I said seemed like it didn't matter to the woman. Like she was just trying to lure me out of the campsite with some two words. Help me! Right after that, I reached into my backpack and pulled out my handgun and kept scanning the forest. After a bit, I could hear far in the distance elk making noises and right after the elk finished, I hear the loudest high-pitched screech that I've ever heard in my life, in the same direction the girl was yelling at me from. And after the screech, I hear movement in the direction of the elk, with the bushes moving violently until the bushes became unmoving and the campground came to a standstill again. After the thing ran away, the foul smell went with it. And though, the rest of the night was calm, except for the same screeching in the distance which sounded like it was miles away, just echoing through the mountains. I have never been more scared in my life. So, I waited until dawn, packed up my things, and headed home. I haven't told anyone my story, but if you have any idea what this could be, please let me know. I guess I should start by saying, this happened in early September of 2016. I'm a 25-year-old female that lives in a really rural part of northern Arkansas with my fiancé. Near the lake to be exact. It's gorgeous. Lots of open farmland, plenty of woods, and barely any neighbors. It's what my soul always wanted. I am an only child. Also, and have been pretty much spoiled my whole life. My father, for as long as I can remember, would randomly bring home toys. Not just little toys, I'm talking go-karts, dune buggies, and even four-wheelers. So, since I was young, I knew how to drive just about any off-road vehicle, and I loved it. We even had jet skis at one point. My parents were very laid back with me, to the point that they would nap during the day and let me ride the dune buggies until dark. I forgot to mention, I just recently moved full-time to the property. For years, we would only visit the land on the weekends. So it's a different feeling knowing you don't have to go back to town. My parents live about three hours away from the land, so seeing them on the weekends is a treat. They bring up all kinds of goodies. The land is beautiful, about 30 acres more than half of which is cleared. Years ago, a small farm was here. 
The old barn still stands, and of course a pond with a ton of frogs. One night, we all got wild hair and decided to go for a night ride. My father now has a jeep, so him and my fiance decided to ride together. Me and my mother decided to ride separate on the wheelers. These four wheelers are fairly new, automatic, so they are ready to ride a while. And damn it, I also forgot to mention that for miles outside of the property is the Cherokee Wildlife Reservation, so there are miles and miles of woods and dirt trails, so many that you could be gone all night. Behind the property about 20 minutes out is a creek. Once you pass through it, you will go up the mountain on the other side of Cherokee. There's also a crap ton of logging roads, but before you get to the logging trails, there's a dirt road you have to take. I have taken this road for years. I have had some weird feelings out there, but this night will be the night that I will always remember until I die. My dad, fiance, uncle and aunt had gone ahead of us, five minutes ahead of us to be exact. My mother and I had been out making a drink. Yes, my wheeler was a cup holder and I was going to bring alcohol with me, damn it. After we passed through the creek and up the mountain, I noticed the beams of my mother's wheeler start to dim. Normally, they do this because your fan too cool engine has kicked on, so I didn't think anything of it. I want to let you know that there are houses near the end of this road and near the beginning, so there's a gap of about 5 miles long of woods, and an occasional dirt road for gas as well. By the way, gas wells are everywhere up here. As we get closer to the trail, we are supposed to take, my mother's wheeler starts backfiring. We stop for a second to see what's going on when it dies. Now, like I said, I've been out in these woods my whole life. I wasn't afraid at all. No weird things or feelings or anything. My mother calls to my dad and tells him what's going on, but no calls are getting through. They must be going down the mountain, my mother said with an aggravated tone. I turn off my wheeler, but leave the lights on. The road is narrow, so narrow that two cars can barely squeeze by. I don't want some drunk guy flying around the corner and not seeing us. As my mother tries to call my dad again, I start looking at her wheeler. Something isn't right with it. There's power to it, but no fuel is getting to the engine, which could be a lot of things causing that. So I get my phone out and text my fiance, letting him know we were stuck in the middle of the road. We were sitting there for a good 10 minutes, when all the hairs in my body start to stand up. I immediately look, look in the direction of the headlights to see a, a man walking from the pitch darkness. He had no light and he said nothing. It took a second for my brain to register what I was seeing. As my mother finally got my dad on the phone, I whispered to her sternly, Mom, there's a guy walking up on us. Now, my mother tends to panic at times. I never took my eyes off him. He was still far enough away that I couldn't make out much features. My mother is freaking out and I tell her to leave the shit and jump on my four-wheeler. As she does, I yell to the guy who is obviously getting closer. Hello, what the hell? He said nothing. This seriously freaks me out. Like who the hell walks down a pitch dark road in the middle of the night without a light? And not say something as you approach other strangers. That's when it dawned on me. He must have been creeping in the woods down the road. Voices echo like crazy out there so he probably knew we were women. Normally, I keep a 38 on me, but my silly ass left it at home. Out of all times, this would be the one time that I forgot it. I start my wheeler up and my mother hops on. The man is still getting closer. Now I can make out a red flannel shirt and dirty jeans, dark hair, but not much more. He had a gun. Not in his hand, but visible on his hip. He still wasn't saying a word, which makes us kind of panic even more. He also was not looking at us, but rather at the ground. I realize I can't back up because I can't see a damn thing behind us. So I threw it in high and took Poff past him. As we passed him, he just stood there, facing and following our direction, yet never looking up at us. It was pretty disturbing. We make it near through the creek and my mother was able to tell my dad everything. He immediately turned around when he heard us yelling. He was at the wheeler in about four minutes. As we met back at the wheeler, the guy is there, on his own wheeler. My mother and I just sat there, staring at this weirdo. He never gave me or my mother eye contact, 
and ended up heading to the creek to talk. As we all shut our vehicles off, my dad asked us, So, uh, where did he come from? I told him, the darkness. He just walked up without a light from the road. My fiancé chimes in. He had a wheeler in and toe straps. Y'all didn't talk to him or anything? My mother and I just stared at him with open mouths. This guy was going to take our wheeler. He never asked us if we needed help. He didn't say or do anything but act weird. The man had told my dad his wife and her people yelling in their driveway. We didn't even pass their driveway. The next day, me and my fiance head to the same spot to check out this driveway. We reached just about halfway there when the four-wheeler had died, and just a few hundred yards down the road was an overgrown driveway. We drove up and decided to walk the rest of the way. Tucked far behind the woods was a rundown barn-like cabin, with no power, no vehicles, and no signs of recent life, and definitely no sign of a wife. There was an outhouse behind the barn. As we walked up to the windows, we noticed the man's wheeler sitting behind the barn. I looked at my fiancé who had a worried look on his face. Inside the barn was stuff that you would expect to see in a garage, no indication that someone was living there. As we backed away slowly, I start to notice that there were vans hidden in the woods, like a homestead. They were run down and I'm pretty sure they didn't run, but still. And that's when my fiancé grabbed my hand and we quickly got back to the jeep. On the way back home, I told him about the vans. He said that he noticed them too. He noticed them at the same time he noticed the man, staring at them from inside the barn. Always bring protection if you're going to be in the middle of nowhere. One time, while driving in the middle of nowhere in France with a friend, the whole night just felt so eerie for some reason. I won't get into all the prior details, but when we parked in front of our hotel, it was strangely quiet and dark. All of a sudden, a group of people in a trance-like state started walking out of the woods from different areas all around the parking lot. The woods were just about a foot away from where we parked our car. It was so creepy and intense. The first person to come out of the woods was a lady. She didn't even acknowledge us as she walked right in front of and beside our car. She was so tranced out. More people hide in the woods than you would think or imagine. Another day, I was walking in the woods in my backyard. I often walked alone in there feeling safe and solace. Once I was pretty far in, I turned around to Ben and was scared out of my wits to see a snaked man just laying there on the side of the path. He must have been slinking his way through the woods to get there before I did or maybe he was just laying there for a long time just waiting for someone to see him or walk into him. I ran like a bat out of hell, thinking he was going to kill me. It's safe to say there are a lot of creepy people as well as creepy creatures lurking out in the woods just outside of our homes. Before I tell you my story, I must give you a bit of background. I live in the state of Idaho in the US. I work on a farm and live in a very small town and live just down the road about an hour from where this happened. But when I heard a story from a neighbor, curiosity got the best of me. My friend Bill told me the story of the water babies. We were at my house in the garage. Bill was talking with my dad about fixing something in the house. The talk moved on to hunting stories, then stories about seeing weird things in the woods. My dad has a ton of stories like that handed down from my grandpa. After a few stories, Bill told the tale like this. You see, the story behind the water babies is that two main native tribes in the area, the Shoshone and the Bunak, or as they call themselves, the Shobans, would perform an ancient ritual. Nobody remembers any specifics of the ritual. It's lost to history, but the purpose is fairly well known. Whenever a set of twins were born, the Shobans would take the babies to the marsh where the Blackfoot and Snake Rivers joined. They would throw the babies in the water, and the one that floated was kept, and the ritual was ended. The belief is that the twin is good, and the other twin is evil, and they believed uh, that the good one would float to the surface, but this meant a lot of babies drowned, whether one or both the twins died. Anyways, it is said that if you drive to Tilden Bridge, which overlooks the smaller of the two rivers, and shut your car off, you will hear odd noises, small thuds and thumps, as if something is crawling all over your car. 
I've heard of water babies before and seen the Tilden Bridge, but I never joined and put the two together in my mind. After Bill told us what water babies were, he told me that after his brother experienced the noises and his friends, they drove away from the bridge on a dirt road. The next morning, Bill's brother got up to find his car not only caked in dust, but covered in small hand footprints. I scoffed at this. It's a fairly lesser known local legend, although old timers are dying out, so it's not as well known anymore. And I never believed it. Until one night two years ago. A group of me and my friends, I was the one driving, and my cousin in the cab, and my girlfriend in the middle front seat, her best friend in the passenger, and the other two girls were in the back. We wanted to spook out the girls, and in all honesty, we all were pretty creeped out as it was. We told them we were looking for ghosts and it was a moonlit night, so if we did see anything, we would be kind of screwed. This amped up the fear of the unknown factor big time. I was driving so I parked and turned my pickup off the middle of the bridge. It is a rarely used bridge due to it being in the middle of nowhere, so I felt comfortable parking on the bridge. We sat in the darkness for a minute expecting something to freak us out. The car was full of us kids being loud and goofing off, so it wasn't too creepy. After a minute or two, we decided to leave nothing, because it was too spooky and nothing was happening. The mist of the river rolled over my truck's windows, which made everything look more horrifying. To tell you the truth, we all decided to do something else, so I turned the key and nothing happened. The girls thought I was playing around and telling me to push it in the clutch, you're just joking. Idiots, let's go. My girlfriend told me, not funny, okay? Just go. I told them that the car was an automatic and had no clutch. The girls grew quiet and I saw them go pale in the moonlight. I tried for about a half an hour to get this car to start, but it just wouldn't work. I was too scared to get out and pop the hood. Everyone was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I kept turning the key, and my girlfriend's best friend in the passenger seat had her window down a small bit through the small slit of the window. We heard a baby screaming not too far from the river bottoms. Mind you, we were miles from the nearest town or any farms, so it couldn't have been some baby a little ways off, because we were in the middle of nowhere like I said before. We were literally like a half an hour from the nearest town. We then started hearing soft thuds and bumps of the roof and hood of the truck. We all freaked out after a few turns, the engine still wouldn't go, until we heard a thud and felt the truck move forward a bit. I turned the key one last time and it started up. We pulled out of there as fast as we could over the dirt road. We were all done with doing anything else that night, so I took everyone home. When everyone was dropped off at home, I drove back to my house parked the truck in the driveway and ran inside. The next morning, my dad yelled at me for letting kids climb over the truck during the night. I told him I wasn't, I wasn't even near any kids last night. He led me to the driveway to the truck and, and said, see all the hand and footprints all over? The truck was covered in dust from the dirt road and as he pointed to it, I noticed small handprints and footprints on the hood and in the bed. It's been two years but I will never go back to Tilden Bridge again. I have experienced some weird crap in my life, but all I know is that I believe in Bill's story.